I will open it up for the discussion. I think we should take three or so uh, questions at a time. And then, yes, and uh, you have there and up there, yes. And uh, yes, first, please, please identify yourself and... Uh, Hi, uh, my name's Nicole Beardsworth. I'm here from WIDA. Um, thank you for the excellent presentations. I really enjoyed all three. Um, I wanted to speak to Professor Pinstrup Anderson um, to begin with. I had some comments and reactions to your paper. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was, I was really, I found it really refreshing that you're looking at this kind of political economy analysis of food prices and um, I was wondering if you track changes in food prices or food policy along electoral cycles. Because in a place like Zambia, this is absolutely critical, how uh, food subsidies at electoral uh, periods are increased and prices are depressed. And then after elections, when the government has more leeway, they would sort of set a bit of a release on the food, uh, food prices. My second question was, um, you had a finding that foreign agencies had very little influence on food policy. And I wonder if that might not be time specific. Because what, what we had, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa over the last 15 years, was the so-called Africa rising period, the boom period. And what we're seeing now in many economies, including Zambia, is a sort of bust period. And we're seeing the the increased intervention of the IMF and the World Bank who are pushing for the reduction of these subsidies. So it might be worth thinking about whether or not that is context and time specific. Um, I had a reaction to uh, Professor San's uh, presentation as well. And I was thinking that really, I, I really liked that you were talking about displacement and food crises, because this is absolutely critical. Because in some ways, it's a double crisis. Many of the people who are displaced were embedded in local economies. They were food producers in their home place. When they were moved to a new place, they're no longer producing in their initial home base. They're not producing in, in displacement camps. And often what happens is when food aid comes in, this is disruptive to local economies in the new place as well. So this interaction between uh, displacement and food crises is absolutely critical. So it occurs to me that the best way to deal with nutritional problems in these cases is an end to the conflict and returning people to where they came from and their re-embeddedness in local economies. But when that's not possible, how would you suggest you go about affecting, you know, uh, positive changes in these kinds of cases? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have a hand over there. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Mikko Perkia from the University of Tampere, Finland. I come from the research group that is research uh, studying child growth, health in, healthiness of living environment based on the data from Malawi. And thank you for your excellent presentations. The question goes mostly to the Dr. Kilima. And I'm asking on, on child growth. So the question links to the argument on the so-called uh, environmental entropathy, a disorder due to frequent intest intestinal infection for viruses, bacteria, or parasites. So it seems that Tanzanian results show that only, only the upest quintile benefits in terms of uh, child healthy growth. So I do simplify now. Could it be that only the rich or, or the upest quintile are able to live in uh, such a safe and clean environment, and they are able to avoid frequent intestinal uh, infections, and w which makes body unable to benefit nutrients. And lastly, the other four quintiles are living not so clean and safe environment. So if it were about poverty and nutrition, maybe it, shouldn't it be other way around? That poorest quintile, we can see dramatic growth failures, or at least it, it would go quintile and quintile, quintile by quintile. So, so the question is about, uh, would the growth puzzle be about how clean and safe environment we are living in? Thank you. Thank you. Was there one hand more? 
then I think we should turn to the panel and you can come back again from the audience. Uh, thank you very much. When I was presenting the context uh, of Tanzania, um, I thought it was very important for me to share first how does the population look like. And yes, um, one thing I should have also said, we have about 80% of our population in the rural areas, so uh, which goes correctly into pointing out like Yes, um, so most of the people who are in the wealthiest uh, quantile, they will also have better services and they will also have access to different utilities, including uh, clean water, while in the rural areas they would like that. So uh, the, four, the four quantiles that we're not doing very well uh, is the reflection of that. So thank you very much for pointing that out. Um. It has everything to do with what governments want to happen next. Uh, in Thailand, um, prior to an election, prior to a vote, the government increased the rice price above the world market price, above the export price. Thailand is a major rice exporter. So the government said, we'll pay you this much more for rice. And of course, the government ended up with a lot of rice because farmers responded and the market wouldn't pay that price. And at one point, Thailand had the equivalent of half a year of international rice trade in their warehouses. They actually did have warehouses. India only had warehouses for about half of what they ended up with. The other half was outside and it was rutted. Uh, and it rutted very quickly. The rats had a, had a good time. Uh, in Zambia, something very similar happened. Um, before an election, the Zambian government increased the maize price, and the Zambian government ended up with a lot of maize. And again, a lot of it was rutted before they could before they could use it. So absolutely, India plays this game from time to time. So you're absolutely correct. And it comes back to the political economy question that you really need to understand what's driving those decision makers if you want to be able to predict anything about what they may do in res uh, respond to, to something uh, that's going to happen in the future. Um, and frequently, we uh, policy analysts are in the dark because we have already made our recommendations, and if they don't follow them, they're not very bright, so we go on to another study. Uh, and I'm as guilty as the next guy. We got we to gotta take this work one step further, and I'm repeating myself. On the foreign agencies' uh, interests, uh, yes, I believe, I believe it, it is context and time specific. Uh, I think it relates a bit, David, to your point, um, uh, namely the visibility part. Um, is any um, development bank or uh, multilateral or bilateral donor uh, going to say to a government, you cannot uh, compensate uh, the losers of food price increase? No, they're not going to do that. So they're going to go along with the government particularly because it doesn't really have much impact on the extent to which those governments can pay back their loans. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why the structural adjustment debate was so heavily directed by the international community was that there was a lot of money hanging out there. And if the governments didn't do what uh, the um, money lenders were, were telling them, the chances were that they would never pay back the loans. That wasn't the case here. This was, uh, this was much less risky for the development banks. And, and I want to repeat what I said before, but the World Bank really made a very special effort to try to uh, deal with, with the food price uh, crisis, much more so than, than I think many of the bilaterals did, although some of the bilaterals differed and others uh, were very, very uh, into that as well. And then it for you. Right. So uh, I'll start by saying I really don't have an answer to your question, except that it's the right one. <laughs> um, you know, as I was saying, you know, earlier problems of famine and food crises, especially when you were, even if you had displaced, firstly, most, most cases people were not displaced. And if they were displaced, they were primarily displaced internally within a set of borders of a state that at least had presumably some interest in uh, over time over uh, in their well-being. Now, 
obviously, in the current context where so many of the displaced people are in, uh, um, externally displaced in, in, and in somebody else's country, um, it's, it's such a formidable problem that I really don't even, I can't even think about what the easy answers are. I mean, I think you've hit all the problems. You know, you, you're basically destroying the, the economy of where they came from because there's nobody working or attending the farm or keeping up the infrastructure or markets become dysfunctional uh, in these failed uh, states or failed regions of countries. And then where they go, there is no opportunity because governments who are hosting them have generally no interest in them being successful there. And how do you reconcile? I mean, they really, um, it's worse than being in no man's land. It strikes me as being in, I, I would use a stronger word for it, but it might not be a polite one. So I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it, it's really a very distressing situation. Um, but I'd be interested if you have any ideas. So my initial suggestion would be maybe what you do is you get the, the new host government to encourage the development of uh, agricultural production in the place where these people live, but on, by citizens. But the trouble is that's a sort of medium to long term goal rather than a crisis solution. Right. No, I think, you know, obviously the cooperation, but, you know, the little bit I do know about this suggests that host governments have been extremely resistant of uh, displaced per persons being integrated into their economy at all. Whether it, I mean, just, they don't want them, they just view it as a threat to, uh, and I don't think this is, <laughs> unfortunately any different in Europe or the U.S. than it is in Jordan or Turkey, but a, a threat to people's li local people's livelihood, their wages, their jobs, um, uh, demands in terms of the fiscal cost of, of caring for these people. So, um, and, and it strikes me as, with few exceptions, maybe the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, anybody who has tried to espouse a uh, uh, a more progressive and I think more correct view of of the potential benefits of uh, of trying to at the margin integrate some of these refugee problems doesn't fare very well in in their political arenas. So it's distressful. Yes. Thank you. More questions. Finn, top. Th thank you very much for uh, three excellent presentations. And of course, they, how can you say, they motivate additional thinking and so on. Uh, David, w one thing I was kind of pondering about whether is that, I mean, I'd like to kind of give you a, a possibility to elaborate a bit on how such an analytical approach might actually look. I mean, you, you sort of indicated that that would be good. Uh, and that something is needed, but I was just sort of wondering what, what are the elements um, that one might try to put together? And, and to Pierre, I mean, I, you know that I completely agree with you in, in, in the sort of identifying that we need to try to understand uh, the political economy of uh, these decision makers. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pondering about whether you would maybe try to elaborate uh, on, on uh, well, how do we then, in turn, get better heard by these policymakers? I mean, how, how, what can one say about that interplay between researchers and policymakers and so on? Because I guess that, um, I mean, you were sort of thinking, well, we need to find out and, and predict how they're going to react next time. But there is also that dimension, which is about how do we then try um, to be better heard? How do we influence them? There's a lot of discussion about policy impact. Um, and I mean, of course, the sort of phrase evidence-based policy making is all over the place. H how does that sort of relate in here? Um, 
uh, is this all just kind of something you would call words? Do they have any real serious meaning? Of course, one can have one's worries when one sort of sees the evidence that then is actually available and then compares that with the type of decisions that are taken. But I was just sort of wondering whether you could elaborate uh, based on these off-the-cuff kind of thoughts. Thank you. Yes, more this round. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Neil Ferguson from the International Security and Development Center in Berlin. Um, I was going to ask almost exactly the same question to David that was just asked behind about how the analytics should look, but I'd like to go one step further with that and ask, how do you incentivize people to provide these analytics? That if I put my humanitarian hat on, I think it's a great idea to try and do evaluations with whatever data is available and produce the best possible results. If I put my researcher hat on, then I begin to worry about where that's going to lead and so forth. And I just wonder, therefore, how you, how you perceive the role of implementing organizations, how you perceive the role of international organizations, and how you perceive the role of researchers in delivering, in delivering reasonably meaningful evaluations of programs when RCTs aren't available, when quasi-experiments aren't available, when maybe even, as you say here, baseline data isn't available. I mean, I know from my own experience working with certain agencies that, you know, they have very small amounts of program data that they are determined to use, and they can use it to do something that they can take to donors and say, yeah, look, we're, we're having an impact here. And I think this is what you're, what you're hinting at here. But at the same time, for researchers, it's something that's going to be time-consuming. It takes just as long, if not longer, to do this analysis than any other sort of analysis but it doesn't lead to the typical research outputs. And I just wonder how you think it, how you think it actually looks to get people, or how you would incentivize people to produce these sorts of analyses rather than trying to chase something that would be an RCT in a less emergency situation. Yes, I will give the word to first to David and Pierre, but I will first ask, uh, also take the opportunity to ask uh, Blandina, what do you feel about the question before about increasing agricultural production? That would be interesting to, to hear your point of view also from your case study from Tanzania, yes. But first, uh, David, I think was a question to you and then to Pierre. Um, yeah, I, I, I again, I, I'm not going to pretend to have Good answers to your questions. I haven't thought long about, I mean, I'm asking the same questions. So, I mean, that's what my thinking about the motivation for this meeting led me in many respects to those same questions. I, I guess I would, I would respond in a few different ways, though. Um, one is, you know, if you think back 25 years ago uh, or 30 years ago, uh, I think NGOs were very reluctant to have like nosy economists and evaluators poke around in their in their programs uh, for fear of kind of discovering uh, ugly truths about either their lack of effectiveness or their lack of efficiency and so forth. And I think over time that has that whole relationship has shifted that uh, institutions, and that also applies to governments. They have learned to see uh, the research community in many respects as their allies or their best source of support because they both can substantiate impact but also help them improve their programming. My guess is that that same kind of trepidation uh, probably applies to many of the institutions view uh, institutions involve emergency programming in terms of their relationship with the research community. So I think there is a process of building trust and relationships that needs to go on. Um, 
And I think I'm sure that that has begun at some level. I just don't see a lot of it in the published literature. So, and I don't know a lot of people doing it. That doesn't mean it's not being done uh, to some extent. But clearly, a lot more can be done. Um, and I think part of it is the researcher research community has to step up to the plate in a in a constructive and a positive way, um, in terms of fostering greater dialogue and, and discussions. Um, the, um, so I think the incentive has to be in terms of we can help you do a better job and we can help you garner more resources. And, and, and I have no doubt that the people who are spending their lives working, whether it's in with displaced people or with you know, uh, refugee populations are very motivated to do a good job. And I think we need to, to, to push that discussion forward. Um, the, uh, but that being said, it also goes back in, in both addressing your question and Finn's question to the extent, best to the extent I can. Um, I, as I said, these emergency situations are not really for the most part, emergencies in the sense that I thought of them back when I was watching television as a child or when I was first working in sub-Saharan Africa and we'd see these emergencies in, in Ethiopia or even my early work in India in the 1970s where there were these real emergencies in the sense that they were acute, short-lived. Short and uh, so I think we need to recognize that these emergencies are tur have turned into largely chronic, s sustained problems, so that I'm really not sure that we can't design research studies. Uh, you know, if it's a year, two years, you know, that's what it is. You know, it, we can still learn a lot. And I think there's a lot of different... Um, questions about what, what works and what doesn't work. And those can be very relatively pedestrian in terms of should we invest in, you know, encouraging people to use latrines or provide soap and clean water. Two more complicated questions that may have to do with how we incentivize, you know, integration into the local communities. And that may involve doing that not only in the context of the camps or the affected populations, the immediately affect, affected populations, but it may be incentivizing, you know, uh, the indigenous populations uh, through, you know, some sort of cash transfer program that says, you know, hire a refugee for the day and see, you know, we'll pay for it. Or, I, you know, I'm kind of being somewhat pejorative in that sense, but I think there are ways of doing this. Uh, you know, who would have thought, and I think there are creative ways of thinking about a research agenda, knowing that these acute situations are not, uh, ha have, have a duration of time. And we haven't applied the creative type. I mean, if you think about, when I think about some of the th things that people are doing RCTs and are experiments about, or collecting data on panel surveys. I would have never dreamed up this stuff 20 years ago. And people are doing incredibly creative work now in the field of micro <coughs> development, basically. And um, whether it be, you know, across all dimensions, and particularly in health and nutrition, but, and I think we can do the same thing in these other contexts, we just haven't put our minds to it. And, uh, and I think, again, back to your earlier point, I think we have to go beyond just the affected populations, but think about the broader uh, geographical context in which displaced people are living and, and, and try to incentivize various types of research programs in those contexts. Again, knowing that you know we're not going to come up with an answer in six weeks or eight weeks, but they'll still be there in six months or six years, unfortunately, in many cases. Uh, yeah.
six years is a bit long for <coughs> somebody at my age, so could we, could we do it a little faster? <laughs> okay. We're on the same, um, same uh, we agree on that one. Okay. Um, and Finn, that of course is the critical next question. How do we implement such wonderful ideas as to try to use political economy approaches to get some real action of the kind that we'd like to have? Um, my hypothesis is that there are quite a few win-wins out there, meaning that if we were to interact with policy advisors and hopefully policy makers as well, as we do our analyses, we could arrive at mutually satisfactory solutions to the problems that the policy maker is particularly interested in and the problems that those of us who are fighting for better health and nutrition are interested in. Um, this may involve a little bit of things you may not like if you are very pure. For example, let's suppose that we could target a transfer program very tightly to low-income families with children at high risk of malnutrition. And let's suppose that it really is so well targeted that no politician cares about it because these poor people have no political power and therefore it is not going to last very long. Maybe as long as an international donor will provide the money, the government will keep it alive. Now suppose that 30% of the benefits from that program is actually designed to the decision makers in government. Sure, it's corruption, it's bribing, of course it is. It's terrible, we don't want it. But suppose that's the best we can do. 70% of that transfer is still arriving where it is supposed to arrive. And my point is, sometimes we let the best stand in the way of the good. Particularly those of us in, in policy analysis, food policy analysis, we deliver a first best solution for the problem we have identified to a policymaker, say the Minister of Finance, who has a million other priorities that are a lot more important than trying to improve nutrition of little Johnny out there in a community that doesn't vote for him or her anyway. We gotta be a little more pragmatic than that. And that's really all I'm saying. No, econometrics may not help us a whole lot. Fair enough, we'll do econometrics on something else. But we really need to get a handle on working together and finding out where are the multiply the, the mutually acceptable solutions to their problems and quote our problems the problems of, of low-income people um, I'm working right now on um, how to change the food system for improved health and that of course includes improved nutrition and and I think the only way that we can make some headway on, on improving the food systems for better health and nutrition is to provide the incentives to the decision makers all the way up the value chain. And that includes the farmers, the traders, the consumers, and yes, the policy makers, and the news media, and the researchers, those who can have an impact. We gotta understand how each of these decision makers um, how they tick, what, they, what goals are they pursuing? Can we, by modifying their goals and our goals, arrive at something that would work for everybody? Is that Pollyannic? Uh, is that kind of wishful thinking? Maybe. But I think it's worth a try. So that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm, I'm going for. We need to design the policies and the programs so that we, we don't simply say to the policymaker or the um, uh, CEO at a, at a big uh, agribusiness corporation, you're stupid because you're not doing what we tell you to do. That's, that's not the way to proceed. Give you another example and then I'll be quiet. The agribusiness corporations that are into food processing 
are delivering to us packaged food that is very high in energy, calories, and very low in nutrients. It is full of sugar and sweetener and fat, and it has very little in terms of micronutrients. That is exactly what we don't need. No, I'm not talking about we in this room. I'm talking about low-income people in developing countries. They are now bombarded with this junk. They don't call it junk food because it's sold in the grocery store in beautiful packages with multicolor. Everything is wonderful, except they don't get very many micronutrients from this. They are iron deficient and they probably become obese if they are not already. And that can happen when the child is five or six years old or even earlier. Now, do we just say, well, sorry, we can't do anything about that? No, we don't. We, go, we try to find out what is it going to take to change the consumer behavior and the behavior of the processing industry. We have a guy at Cornell by the name of Brian Wansing who's written a couple of books about this. He's got all kinds of innovative ideas about how to change the behavior both of the consumer and the processing industry. So there are things we can do. Uh, it's very messy. Maybe we don't really want to get into that. We'd rather run another econometric model that's cleaner, but, but if we really want to have an impact, we've got to get right in there and see how we can change the behavior of these various decision makers. And I think there are tremendous possibilities that have not been pursued yet. Um, let me make one other point since I have the floor and you haven't, you haven't showed the one minute now. One of the things I've, I, I didn't get to in my list because I stopped when the chairman said time to stop, when his alarm clock went off, is we need to work with those people who can influence the World Trade Organization to change the behavior of food exporters. We have so many regulations for food importers, how they should behave. We have virtually nothing for food exporters. So when India and Cambodia and a few other countries could suddenly stop exporting rice from one day to the next, that is not orderly trade, and WTO stands for orderly trade. So that was one of the points I didn't get, uh, didn't get to talk about, but it's very much on my mind. I don't know how to do it, but there must be somebody who can make that happen. Thank you. And I will give the Plandina the chance to the final word, and you can comment also on these wider issues, or you can comment on... Okay, uh, thank you very much. And whatever you didn't have time to say, now is the chance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll talk a bit about the, 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 the issue you asked me to talk about, the increase in uh, agricultural productivity and the impact that uh, we see or not see. Uh, so the one thing that for sure that we've been seeing in Tanzania is uh, with the increase in productivity, uh, the first thing is we've been having more choices. Uh, it was very common when you're in Da, let's say, uh, you will only get mangoes in December. Once it's January, full stop, you won't see anything. But then now with uh, uh, more, um, more innovative ways of producing, we're able to get not only one type of mangoes, but then different uh, varieties. But then again, with also increasing productivity, then you have even farmers using less time, less land, and perhaps less water. But then the discussion on irrigation, I won't touch on that because uh, um, that is something I know um, um, it's, it's, we're working on it uh, very much. But then to touch a little bit on the point that uh, Pia just mentioned, so... We've seen the increase in productivity, meaning there is a lot of uh, um, increase in production, but we're also seeing a lot of increase in losses in the post-harvest uh, post losses. So that's the other area um, that we have really to work on. In addition to that, um, as I said, now we have our second year, five-year uh, five development plan focusing on industrialization. It's good that we're encouraging to have that, but then, like uh, Pia just said earlier, 
the industries that will be processing the foods, will they make sure they return or preserve the nutrients that are required, or are they just going to be uh, just uh, producing uh, things out there? <laughs> so it will be very important uh, to have partnerships, not only between the government, but also the technocrats, all those uh, who know the nutrients that are required, but also the ones who will be setting up all these different uh, uh, small or big scale industries that will be uh, used. Now, the last point that I would like to say is when we talk about the increase in production, on the household side, on the household side, this is really good because then it means if they were using a bigger portion of their money to buy food, now they have more money to do something else because now they can spend less and less. For the industry, even better. Even when the workers come to argue, they'll be like, yeah, 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 we know the price of food has also been going down. So like, it's easy for them to argue why we're going to pay you for, for, for less. So I think there is, uh, it's a win-win, but also um, it's an area um, that will still have some challenges as we uh, move on. Yeah. Um, and then the last bits uh, around that, um, there have been tendencies, if we speak about, let's say, agriculture, we we'll only want to concentrate on one actor, and that one actor is simply a farmer uh, caring a little bit maybe less about the input providers and the, and the later on even the, the other, uh, the buyers and what have you. Uh, for us, I think the the... the when we look into the entire production, whether it's for the country or outside the country, the standards need to be within uh, Tanzania for all the different actors who are in the chain, not only the input providers, but also for the farmers and also the, the feedback also from the, from the, from the consumers themselves. Because at the end of the day, if we continually continue to punish the farmer and just pay them, let's say, the, the whatever remains, uh, we don't want them to stop producing because we still want to eat. And not just eat, but eat well, food with all the required nutrients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have come to a close and we have had three very heavy and uh, excellent papers. And, and I wouldn't summarize anything, but I would just say that one thing that has stri uh, strikes me after, strike me after the after the seminar is that it, you have presented all of you some basic challenges for future research. I think that has really come out of this. So, uh, so thank you very much. Let's give them a hand. Mm -hmm.